Greetings YouTubers, my name is PhD Tony and today I will be continuing my introduction to atmospheric physics. As you may recall, in the last episode I reviewed the molecular kinetic theory of matter and the properties of gases under this theory. Today we will move from that base on to a discussion of gas pressure and how it is measured. As with my last video, this video was inspired by a series of stupendously incoherent pronouncements on these subjects by prominent flat earthers. The preeminent authority on the subject of gas pressure and atmospheric dynamics within the Flat Earth community is none other than Spurs Chemo. Here we catch up with him during an appearance on Fight the Flat Earth's channel, where he is in conversation with Brainy Beaver and Craig. Okay, so we detect temperature. You've just told me it's cold. It's cold at the top of a mountain. It's cold at the bottom of a mountain. But pressure, you haven't detected and you haven't demonstrated. This claim alone was more than slightly eye-opening, but Spurs was far from finished educating us on this topic. Can breathe. Uh, you're you saying are that air pressure is dependent on temperature. So what I'm trying what to say to you no, is, if you, that is no, the no, pressure, no, no, he's saying there pressure? is. No, he's saying there is no pressure. It's just a difference. What are you talking in about temperature? pressure? What kind of pressure? Later on in the same appearance, Craig was kind enough to invite me on. And I have to admit, I had some questions about Spur's theory. Um, how do you think planes work? Planes? Well, they have an engine, yes. they create lift, uh, they create a how force. How do they create lift? How do they create lift? Oh, uh, I'm not an expert on airplanes, sir. Okay, um, it's through the difference of air pressure on the top and the bottom of the wing. So... Um, the fact that planes work would tend to contradict your suggestion that there is no such thing as air pressure, wouldn't it? A lesser intellect than Spurs Chemo might have been somewhat handicapped by a complete ignorance of aeronautical principles. However, within 90 seconds, Spurs had remedied this shortcoming and put aside his previous humility and was now ready to educate the world on how planes actually worked. Um, but the whole field of aeronautical engineering is based on the existence of a um, pressure differential between the top of the wing and the bottom of the wing. Um, this is why wings are shaped as they are, and it is how um, and it, it is how um, we uh, explain planes working. Now, if there is no such thing as air pressure, as you have previously maintained, then I would like you to explain how planes work. So and there's I would, a temperature. I, I would like you. To, temperature. Sir, I would temperature. like you. In a subsequent text discussion with one Anthony Riley, I was surprised that he chose to defend Spurs' position and indeed offered it as flat earth community orthodoxy on the subject of atmospheric dynamics and gas pressure, or at least it was at that point in time. Modesty forbids me from engaging too directly with Mr. Riley's flattering but deeply misguided obsession with my genitalia. Several weeks after his appearance on Fight the Flat Earth's channel, Spurs Chemo returned to participate in a debate on Red's Rhetoric's channel. Given how deeply considered and meticulously researched his original position had obviously been, it was somewhat surprising that during this appearance he took the opportunity to change his stance. Just how much uh, atmosphere pressure do you think there is at over 300,000 kilometers distance from the Earth? The pressure, it's, it's exactly the same, it's a different temperature, the only change. So the pressure is the same, you're saying? Okay. The pressure is the same everywhere, yeah. So if you go higher or lower, you'll experience the same pressure because um, you'll just experience different temperature. Now, we know that because when those rockets go up, they don't explode. To the casual observer, Spurs' pronouncements may seem like the nonsensical ravings of a deranged lunatic but they serve a useful clinical purpose. Anyone who thinks that they make any sort of sense whatsoever is obviously suffering some sort of neurological dysfunction and should seek urgent medical attention. But we have lingered in la-la land long enough. It's time to turn our attention to some science. The impact of a gas molecule against a surface applies a force against the molecule. The molecule's velocity has changed, therefore the molecule has been accelerated, therefore a force has been applied. By Newton's third law of motion, any force applied to the molecule by the surface must have an equal and opposite force applied to the surface by the molecule. 
The pressure applied by the gas against a surface is simply the force exerted by the impact of the gas molecules divided by the area over which those impacts occur. The magnitude of this force depends on the velocity of the gas molecules and the frequency with which they impact the surface. In the temperature and pressure conditions that apply near Earth's surface, a single cubic centimeter of atmosphere contains 2.7 by 10 to the 19 gas molecules. That's 27 billion billion molecules. The average speed of these molecules is 515 meters per second. As a result of these staggeringly large numbers, the frequency of collisions between gas molecules and surfaces is extremely high. But the frequency of these collisions may be further raised by introducing more gas molecules or by reducing the volume that the gas occupies. Conversely, the frequency of collisions may be reduced by reducing the number of gas molecules available for collisions or by increasing the volume occupied by the gas. The temperature of a gas is directly related to the velocity of its component molecules. Changing the temperature of a gas in contact with the surface therefore changes the kinetic energy of the gas molecules impacting that surface and directly influences the gas pressure applied against that surface. For a fixed amount of gas at a fixed temperature, the pressure exerted by that gas is inversely proportional to the volume occupied by the gas. This relationship is described by Boyle's law. For a fixed amount of gas at a fixed pressure, the volume occupied by that gas is proportional to its temperature. This relationship is described by Charles' law. At fixed pressure and temperature, the volume occupied by a gas increases in proportion to the amount of gas present. This relationship is described by Avogadro's law. These three physical principles have been extensively observationally validated and may be combined to form the ideal gas law, presented here in a slightly adjusted form suitable for use in atmospheric physics calculations. The ideal gas law has itself been extensively observationally validated and has been found to be appropriate for gases that are not at extremely low temperatures or extremely high pressures. A variety of different physical mechanisms have been exploited in the design of gas pressure sensors, but common to all of these designs is the principle of measuring the force applied to a fixed surface area. In the case of a mercury barometer such as the one pictured here, gas pressure is applied to the surface of a reservoir of mercury, which is consequently displaced into an evacuated glass tube. The amount of mercury displaced into the tube is directly related to the gas pressure applied to the reservoir. Aneroid barometers are built around an evacuated metal canister. This canister will expand if the pressure applied to it is reduced and will contract if the pressure applied to its exterior is increased. These expansions and contractions are directly related to the position of a dial by a spring and a gear. Microelectromechanical barometers work by detecting the change in capacitance or resistance as a diaphragm is deformed by gas pressure. Regardless of the style of gas pressure sensor being employed, the sensor is only sensitive to the impact of gas molecules against its detection surface. The sensor itself has no idea if it is inside a vessel or outside of a vessel. It cannot determine its location. All that gas pressure sensors can detect is the force of gas molecules impacting against the detection surface. Nothing else is relevant. If we remove the gas pressure sensor from the system, gas pressure at the point formerly occupied by the sensor does not magically disappear. It does not drop to zero. Gas molecules continue to impact the surface formerly occupied by the detection sensor with the same mean velocity and the same frequency of collision. Any object occupying this point will be subjected to the same pressure as the sensor. It follows, therefore, that gas pressure does not require a physical surface in order to exist. It may be calculated across any nominal surface. We may further illustrate this point by considering a gas pressure sensor inside an open vessel. The pressure inside and outside the vessel are effectively the same, and the presence of the vessel walls has no impact on the pressure measured by the sensor. This remains the case even if the vessel is subsequently sealed. The pressure measured by the sensor is not dependent on the presence of the walls or the seal at the top of the vessel. In this case also, the pressure inside the vessel and outside the vessel are effectively the same and will remain the same unless some work is done upon the vessel or the gas inside it. 
Having isolated the gas within the vessel, we may now change the temperature of the gas, change the amount of gas present, or change the configuration of the vessel, and thus the volume occupied by the gas. In this last case, the reaction force applied by the walls of the vessel is being used to change the pressure within the vessel. But this is only a particular special case of a much broader range of physical phenomena. As I discussed in my previous video, gases and liquids are both characterized by a loose molecular organization. This lack of a rigid molecular structure makes fluids particularly susceptible to shear forces, and they will adapt their geometry to conform to the forces that they are subjected to. Reaction forces applied by the walls of the vessel in which a fluid is contained are the most obvious and commonplace example of this phenomenon, but it applies more generally to any force the fluid is subjected to. For instance, ionized gases or clouds of plasma will adopt a geometry to conform with electromagnetic forces they are subjected to. This is illustrated here by this picture of the inside of a tokamak fusion reactor. Similarly, gases and liquids will conform to the gravitational forces that are applied to them and adopt an appropriate geometry. The equipotential surfaces of Earth's gravitational field are very approximately spherical. As a result, Earth's atmosphere and hydrosphere adopt a spherical geometry to conform to the gravitational forces applied to them. On smaller scales, fluids can be demonstrated to conform to the gravitational forces applied to them by the existence of tides. The amplitude and rhythm of tidal signatures is exactly as predicted by examining the gravitational forcing of the Moon, Sun and other celestial objects. While ocean tides are the most obvious and commonly experienced expression of this physical phenomenon, the solid Earth and the atmosphere both also experience tidal forcing. I have shown here the M2 and T3 components of the atmospheric tides and the atmospheric loading correction that must be applied to GPS time series. This correction is required because tidally forced atmospheric loading applies a force to Earth's surface which results in a surface deformation. So today we have discussed the physical phenomenon of gas pressure, what causes it, how it is measured, and the physical laws that relate it to gas temperature, gas volume, and the amount of gas present. We have also considered practical examples of the response of fluids, both gases and liquids, to the forces applied to them, be they reaction, electromagnetic, or gravitational forces. Armed with the information presented in this video, we can return to Spurs Chemo's original pronouncements. His claim that atmospheric pressure does not exist and cannot be demonstrated is simply delusional. Even leaving aside direct observations of atmospheric pressure, it is obvious that without atmospheric pressure, birds, planes and gliders could not stay airborne. They do stay airborne, therefore atmospheric pressure exists. Similarly, his claim that atmospheric pressure is everywhere uniform can be directly contradicted even without instrumental observations of atmospheric pressure. In particular, we can use the change in the boiling point of liquids with altitude. I, for one, am very curious about how he will be wrong the next time he chooses to publicly humiliate himself. But I guess we'll just have to wait and see. Well, I guess that about does it for this episode. Thank you very much for watching, and I hope you'll join me again next time when I move on to atmospheric pressure gradients and how they are governed by Earth's gravitational field. See you then.